Hmm. Amen. All right. If you have your Bibles with you, we're going to be in John chapter 1, the Gospel of John chapter 1. And for this first Sunday of Christmas, that word of hope, that Emmanuel is coming, that even to a tribe that had never heard of the gospel, heard of Christ, that God still gets his message to them, that hope still runs across this world, that Christ can change lives. And the word for hope this Christmas, we're going to read here in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. John chapter 1, it's a familiar passage, and you may think, is this Christmas? Man, it's, this is very Christmas, all right? John chapter 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 5. Would you stand, please, for the reading of God's Word? The Gospel of John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Let's pray. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you have it written for us. Thank you that the word came down and lived among us. We praise your name, Lord, and pray that your word will penetrate us and live in us and not return unto you void. We pray all these things in the name of your Son, Christ. Amen. Thank you, and be seated. When I was uh, right out of seminary, actually, one of my heroes, a guy named D.A. Carson, came to our seminary and gave a lecture using this passage and uh, opened my eyes up to that word, word, um, real nicely. I've heard a lot of guys try and tell us that, you know, all the philosophical background of the word, and Dr. Carson, all he said was, no, think of it like the Old Testament, God's Word. And when we think of Jesus like that in this passage, when we think that he is the embodiment of God's Word, we start to see some great and wonderful things about him as we begin this Christmas season. Every year at Christmas, yes, we focus on Jesus. Why? He's not just the reason for the season. He's the reason for our being here. It is because Jesus Christ came, God the Son, born of the Virgin, God from ages past, taking on human flesh and suffering as a human for humans, that we might not suffer the sting of condemnation. He give, did this to give us eternal life. And so at Christmas time, I know that we don't know for sure he was born on December 25th. We don't even know if he was born this time of year. But I think it is worth celebrating the fact that the Lord came among us and lived among us and died for us and rose again to give us all eternal life. And so when we think about him and we start to think, we're all familiar with the story of Bethlehem, but what happened before that? Because we read here in chapter 1, verse 1, what do we see? In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning you know, that's how your Bible starts, isn't it? In the beginning, Genesis chapter 1. The idea here is, <clears throat> above all else, that he wasn't just born on Christmas Day. That was the day he took on human flesh. Jesus, God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, was there all along. There was never a time when he was not and the idea here is to remind us that Christmas didn't start in December. It started long before. In the beginning was the Word. Now, as we look at the Old Testament, what does it mean? that How, how can it be so special? Why would John in his gospel, why would the Holy Spirit inspire him to use the word, Word, to describe Jesus Christ? And we know it does describe Jesus as you read through here and you get down to verse 14 and it tells us the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Why does he use this word, word? First off, we're reminded that God's word, when it goes out, always does what God intended. The word always accomplishes God's purpose. God does not speak vainly. His words are not just ink on a page or air floating, sound waves floating into our ears. 
God's word is so much more. In fact, as Isaiah the prophet stated it, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void or empty, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. So God is telling us first off, the word, his word, when it goes out, it gets something done. Some of us have children. Some of us have told them children to do something. Some of us have told them to do that thing more than once. Some of us have told them repeatedly over the course of years not to do that, and they keep doing it. We do not know what it's like for our word to go out and accomplish what we meant for it to do, right? We get frustrated a lot of times because our word didn't get a silly thing done when we sent it out. Nobody listened, nothing happened. But God, when he speaks, does it happen? Look what he says. It doesn't return to me void. When God speaks, something happens. When God speaks, changes come. It does not return to him empty-handed. It does not return to him void, but it accomplishes what I please. You and I might, you and I may try and resist God's word, but eventually he's going to win, isn't he? And then we come and we say, well, what's that got to do with Jesus? Well, he's called the word here. Why? Well, maybe perhaps in John chapter 6, verse 38, Jesus says, I come down, for I have come down from heaven. Not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. He's the word sent from heaven to accomplish what God wanted to accomplish. What was God wanting to accomplish? That whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. To fulfill his purpose of redeeming mankind. To save us from our sins. That we might be to the praise of his glory all gathered with him up there in heaven. I love this year's uh, theme for Lottie Moon, our international missions offering. This great pursuit. And he's comparing what we've got going on on earth to what we're going to see in Revelation chapter 7. Where we have people from every nation, tribe, and kindred all gathered together worshiping God. And you can tell their differences because when you see them, John says, and they're from every tribe, nation, color, he can tell the difference. It's not like we lose all our differences when we get there. They are glorified. And we unite together in him. Why? Because God sent the word. And Jesus is going to accomplish exactly what his father wanted him to do. I didn't come to do my own will. But the will of him who sent me. Because when God sends his word, his word gets things done. And Jesus Christ did it all. He paid it all. He suffered upon that cross. He died. He was put in that tomb with a Roman guard out in front of it to keep this very thing from happening. What very thing? The stone being rolled away and Christ walking out of there. And because he did that and ascended to heaven, here we are, 20 centuries later, still worshiping him. The word always accomplishes what God sent it out to do. Maybe that's one reason why he is called the Word. Because Jesus came and accomplished what God's purpose was. A second reason about the Word and why we might use that is because the Word carried out creation. Again, those first three words of John, those first three words of Genesis, in the beginning. What beginning? Whenever that was. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But look at what John says. In the beginning, verse 1, was the Word. And the Word was with God. The Word was God. And He was in the beginning with God. So what are we establishing? In the beginning, Genesis 1, it wasn't just God. It was Christ also. It was the Holy Spirit also. When you go back to John, Genesis chapter 1, you will see that the Spirit of God hovered or brooded over the waters. You will also see later on the Lord say, let us make man in our image. Not my image. Not singular. Plural. Why? There's a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Even in the beginning. In the very beginning. Verse 3. All things, this word, 
All things were made through him. Think about that. See, when we go back to Genesis, what do we see there? We see that God spoke and it happened. Let there be light and there was light. Oh, you didn't die on me, did you? There we go. By the word of the Lord. I love this passage in Psalms. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Let there be light, there was light. Let there be firmament, let there be stars, let there be planets, let there be, and there was. By the word of the Lord, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Just like you and I, when we speak, that breath comes out. There is so much power in the Lord that planets and solar systems created by that breath. And Christ was there. As we saw in verse 3, all things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. When did this happen? In the beginning. We've got several passages. Colossians chapter 1 and Hebrews chapter 1 also tell us that Jesus the word was there at creation. Again, God's word always accomplishes what he sends it out to do. God's word, Jesus Christ, God the Son there also. And all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Colossians goes on to say, and all things are still held together by him. The reason our atoms just don't go spinning out of control and us disintegrating is Jesus Christ holding it all together. This is the power of the word. This is the power of Christ. This word, word, speaks of how he reflects the power of his Father. All things being made by him, there is nothing that wasn't made by him. Sometimes we're shocked. Well, I thought Jesus wasn't born till Christmas. No, Jesus is your creator. He has the authority to tell you what to do. He will be king and kings and lord of lords, not just because he's your creator, but because he died upon that cross. He took all of our sin upon him. He took the blame and the punishment and the condemnation for our failure, for our imperfections, and he rose from the grave after all of that. That now he is king of kings and lord of lords. He has done everything one possibly could. He created us. He came and lived like one of us. He was tempted just like we are. He died like one of us, but he didn't stay dead. Praise his name. The word is so exemplary of the power of God. In fact, we can go on and say that the word is bringing the revelation of God. What do we mean by this? Do you want to know what God is like? Read his word. Pastor, can you describe God to me? Well, I'm probably going to tell you to read Isaiah chapter 40. Tells you a lot about God in that chapter. How he holds the oceans in the hollow of his hand. How the grass withers and fades and he makes it grow. And, and you can go through the many places in the Bible and see this is what God is like. We just didn't make this up. We didn't make it up. No, this is him as he's revealed himself. The word of the Lord came to me, the prophet says, all over the place in the Old Testament. We're just using Jeremiah 1 as an example. But when God sent his word out, it told us something about him. It revealed his heart, his righteousness. It revealed his grace, his mercy, his judgment. His word revealed who he was. And then we see in Christ that we beheld his glory. And when we looked upon Jesus, we beheld the glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The idea is this, if you want to see the glory of God, you look at Jesus. You want to see what God is like, read the Gospels. Read how Jesus acted, read how Jesus reacted, read what he said, read and listen to him as he spoke and as he acted and the miracles he did and the storms he calmed and the people that he healed and the parables that he told and you will see the heart of God in all of this. The Bible makes it clear to us, no man has seen God, but we've beheld Christ. And we behold his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of the grace and truth that the Father has. You want to see God the Father? Look at Jesus. You want to know what God is like? Find out about Jesus. You want to hear from God? Listen to Jesus. In all of this, he's revealed to us. The word reveals to us 
who the Father is. And of course, the Word brings salvation. The Word delivers salvation. One of my favorite Psalms is Psalm 107, where it simply says, He sent His Word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Here's the picture. We, if you read that psalm, have made a mess. And God sent his word. God said the word. Remember when, when Jesus they came and told him their, their child was dying, and they said, Jesus, just say the word, and I know they'll be healed. You remember that? This is what's happening here in Psalm 107. He sent his word, they were healed. He sent his word, they were delivered from their destructions. And so this is what the Son has done. As many as have received Him, to them He gives the power to become the children of God, even to those who believe in His name. You see, the Word brings salvation. And if you believe in that Word, if you know that Word, if you reach out to that Word, the Word who was in the beginning, the Word who was God, who was with God, He takes action. And saves your soul. And cleanses your heart. You and I may wonder why God seems so far away. But with John chapter 1, we're being told God the Almighty came down here among us. God the Almighty who created the heavens and the earth. God the Almighty who can show us who Jehovah God is. God the Almighty, who saved them in the Old Testament, has come to save us. As the Word walks among us, and we behold His glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, and He has been made flesh, and He, he walks among us, and then we look to Him, and we find out He alone brings salvation. He alone makes Christmas worth having. The gift of God's Son, the gift of the Word, to come and walk among us. This is Christmas. This is the hope we have. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He's leaving no confusion here as to who Jesus is. John starts his gospel different than the other three. Why? Because we needed this point of view to be reminded. We can go to Matthew and Luke and we hear the familiar stories of the angels appearing to Joseph and Mary. We hear the stories of them going to the manger in Bethlehem. Mark just starts out with Jesus about already grown and ready to get out there and start getting baptized and reaching people. John comes back and says, let's take it all the way back in the beginning. We want to make sure you clearly understand just as his miraculous birth attended by angels and the wise men and the rest of it, so also this is a divine event. This is God the Son coming to earth. God who in the beginning created. God who in the beginning was there with God and was God. We don't worship three gods, but we worship one God with three persons. Might be hard for us to understand on a, on a human level, but the simple fact is, he's trying to tell us here, this was no ordinary baby. There was no chance event that Christ was born in Bethlehem. It was the Word. God's Word that never returns void, but always accomplishes. It was the Word. The Word that reveals God. The Word that brings salvation. The Word that creates and makes new creations. See, that's one of the blessed things about it. When you wonder, this Christmas, you know, I mean, got New Year coming up and, you know, I need a new year, a new me and all that. If anyone is in Christ, he has made a new creation. Old things have gone away. All things are made new. You want a new start, this is where it's found. In the word of God, Jesus Christ. Coming to him. If anyone is in Christ, he's made a new creature, a new creation. Old things pass away. Your old life, your old sin, your old voices, your old failures, your old everything. And you've got a new start in Christ. 
Don't wait till New Year's. Today could be that day for you. Today could be the day that salvation comes to you. That whoever believes in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. What do I got to do, Pastor? Well, He told us there in John chapter 1, verse 12, as many as receive Him, He gave the power to become the children of God. Right here, right now, what if you told Him, yes, Jesus, I need you in my life to overcome my past, to overcome my failure, my sin, my errors, my defiance, my disobedience. I've made a mess of my life. It goes back to Psalm 107. And he heard their prayer. And he delivered them from their destructions. And he can clean up the mess that you've made if you call upon his name. Is that possible? Right here, right now, today. Pray from your heart, Lord Jesus, I need you. I don't know what words to say, Pastor. Probably you don't need to know the right words. You need to just communicate to him, Lord Jesus, I need you. I believe you died upon the cross for me and rose from the grave on the third day. I need you. Would you pray that this morning? And if you do, come and tell me about it. We're going to sing a song here in a minute. And when we're singing, if you're ready to take that step, come and tell me and let me pray with you, okay? So let's bow our heads. And we're going to pray. Father in heaven, what a good thing it is to know that you came among us. That in sending your son, you sent the best. You sent the only one who could overcome sin. He lived a sinless life while he was encased in human flesh. He made no mistakes. And when he died, it was your purpose that he die. Your word went out and accomplished exactly what you sent him to do. To suffer for our sins and to rise out of that grave. And now salvation has been purchased for it. Lord, there are those here who need it. Who are crying out and saying, Jesus, come into my life. Hear their prayers, Lord. For those of us who are Christians to remind us what a glorious gift we have. Every time we look to you. That you held nothing back. That he who would not withhold his own son, how would he not give us all things freely? What a privilege it is to be your child. We pray these things in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So we're going to sing.